Today, I really want to share with you how God has used my life, my family's life, and why he was able to use our lives. And to do this, I have to take you back quite a long way. I'm 57 now. I'm getting old. Uh, but when I was seven, my mother became a seven-day Adventist, and I went along to church with her and was pretty much a normal Adventist kid. Um, I loved Jesus, but my mind was really focused on things of the world. And as I went up through school, I wasn't very academic at all. I struggled, but managed to pass each year and move on. And I set my heart on becoming a biologist. And I fell in love when I was young. I actually got engaged when I was still 16. Uh, my wife was only 15 when I asked her to marry me. Uh, we it was actually not 21 when we got married. We were not, I was 19, she was 18. We were both university students. We both had our career planned out for us. She was studying to be a podiatrist and I was studying to be a biologist. We saw ourselves living in Western Australia and uh, that was about as far as we'd actually got. I hadn't sort of got to the point of thinking about having a home, et cetera, because we were both married students. We were just trying to get through our academics first. But after we got married, God took advantage of something that we did for worship. Now, one day when I'd gone back to the boarding school where Wendy, my wife and I had met called Carmel College, they had a book sale on and they were cleaning out books from their school library and they were selling mission story books really cheap. And so I thought, well, that'd be fun. We'll just buy a bunch of mission story books. So I literally bought a box of mission, missionary story books. And after Wendy and I got married, we started reading them for our evening worships. And we'd read one book after another, night after night, week after week, month after month. And by about a year and a half into our readings, God had managed to start changing something in our thinking. And we began thinking, life looks pretty interesting if you're a missionary. You get to go to exciting places. You get to experience exciting things. And uh, you get more opportunity to lead people to Jesus. And so we began praying about it, and we decided together, okay, we are going to go and be missionaries. And so we applied to the General Conference uh, Volunteer Department. We didn't see ourselves going as paid missionaries. Uh, we would go as volunteers. And so we applied and said, look, we'll go anywhere. We'll do anything for any length of time. Now, those three things are very important in the decision we made. We had told God, God, we will do exactly that. We'll go wherever you send us. We'll do whatever you ask us to do for however long you ask us to do it. So basically, we took all the limitations away from God. He could do with us whatever he chose. And so after filling out all this paperwork and sending it to the general conference, we waited, and eventually the letter came a long-awaited letter that would tell us where we were going to go and serve as missionaries. And it was a very short letter, and it simply said, sorry, you don't have any experience. We can't use you. And for us, uh, that was not God's answer. That was man's answer. And so we began pursuing uh, alternative ways of becoming missionaries. And we actually had something lined up. We were going to go to Papua New Guinea and hike up into the mountains and work in a backslidden village. But we had got a little bit ahead of God. God had a, his plan. It just hadn't come time for us to see it fully. But it, when the time came, in a very providential way, and I don't have time to give you all the details tonight, but God called us to the country of Western Samoa. And I was to go there and teach science and math. 
And so because of the providential way that God showed us, we canceled our plans for Papua New Guinea. And instead of going as volunteers, we went as paid workers for the church. Well, that was um, a long time ago. That was 1985, January 1985. And we landed in Western Samoa um, in the, the middle of the day, first experience to be in the tropics. It had just rained. We had to walk on the tarmac. It was like being in a sauna. And there was nobody at the airport to pick us up because a cyclone had come through and delayed our plane and the people who were supposed to pick us up didn't know when the plane was arriving. And so we sat around at the airport for a couple of hours watching people. And this was our initiation to the mission field. And after a couple of hours, uh, bus driver said, oh, you better come with me. Where do you want to go? And uh, so they dropped us at the uh, Samon Adventist Mission. And there began our mission experience. And so for three years, we were there in Western Samoa. And I was teaching, I was farming, Wendy was taking care of the medical needs of the kids at the school. And life was really, really good. But God had sent us there for a purpose. He wanted to train us. That letter we got from the general conference saying, you don't have any experience, it was true. But God put us in the field where we could get experience, experience that would ultimately enable us to do what we do today. After three years in Samoa, we got a call to move to Fiji, to uh, Fulton College. And again, I would be teaching science and helping grow vegetables. And we did that for a couple of years. And during that time, our family began to grow. And our first son, Caleb, was born. And then uh, God put it in my heart to do a radical thing. Now, God usually asks us to do radical things. And that was that I resigned from my teaching position and take on the job as farm manager at the school, a, a national position. That meant quite a salary cut. And during this time, Shannon, our second son, came along. So we are now volunteer missionaries. And we did that for two years. And God, he began to speak to me and say to me, I want you to be a pastor and I want you to work for ADRA. And it's like, God, ADRA, no problem. Pastor, that's not going to happen. I don't have any theology training. I didn't go to an Adventist university. Uh, but Okay, well, let's pursue the ADRA course. God, of course, he can see all things. He knows what he's talking about. And uh, we shouldn't doubt it when he calls us to do something. We say, oh, I can't do that. God can equip us to do whatever he wants us to do. And so we left Fiji. We went back to Australia, waited for a job with ADRA. And the job came. And, well, actually, ADRA offered me two jobs. Now, it's, most people struggle to get one job, but here I have to make a choice. Which one would I like? Would I like to go to Africa, to Zambia, or would I like to go to Cambodia? Um, Wendy, my wife, and I, we both put up our hands for Zambia. Africa sounded good. And uh, we said, basically, God, what's your choice? He said, Cambodia. And so we know from experience, the best place to be in this world is the place where God chooses for you. And so we packed up our little family. Uh, our youngest son, Shannon, he was uh, just six months at that time. Oh, sorry, nearly one year at that time when we arrived in um, Cambodia. And this was 1992. And we arrived there. My job was to help rice farmers improve their rice yields in irrigated land around Simrip town. Well, that was going to be fun. I'd never grown rice before. 
So I was going to help people that were growing rice all their lives for generations, in fact, and I'd never done it myself, but God can help us. And uh, we settled into that work, but very, very quickly, within the first two days of being in Siem Reap, I saw we weren't here in Siem Reap to help people grow rice. That would be an excuse for being here. God had brought us to this town to help people know Jesus. Cambodia is a Buddhist country. And when I arrived in the town of Siem Reap, there were very few Christians in this town. And there was obviously a great need. And God, in his wisdom, he chose to put me in an apartment that backed on to a Buddhist temple. And so on my second day of being in Cambodia, I'm up on the roof, the flat concrete roof of this building, having my devo devotional time, listening to the Buddhist monks chanting in the background. And then uh, I'm looking at the smoke rising up from people's cooking fires. Uh, and I hear the sound of a cart creaking down the road. And I look over the wall and there's an ox cart being pulled by two cows. And it was like I had gone back at least 100 years in time. And as this dawned upon me, I felt... It's hard to explain. I felt this sense of joy, of peace. God was telling me, you're home. And this was not home. This was a foreign country. I didn't speak the language. I didn't know the culture. The food was different. Uh, but there in that moment, God worked a miracle in my heart. And Cambodia became home. And since then, it has been my home. And I don't desire to live anywhere else. These people are my people. And uh, I love them very much. Well, when I moved to Siem Reap, I had to leave my family in Phnom Penh. And that was a little bit of a struggle to do. And uh, missionaries often have to make some tough decisions when it comes to family. And the reason this was a tough one for me, because when we arrived in the Phnom Penh airport, it was over 40 degrees Celsius, and my older son, Caleb, came down sick immediately. And two days later, he was still running a fever of 40 degrees Celsius. And my ADRA director, he's saying, okay, you need to go up to Siem Reap. And so I've got this very sick child and there's basically no medic, decent medical facilities in Phnom Penh at that time. And I'm being asked to leave him and, and go and get started on the ad project. So early on, I learned that I have to give my family to God and put them in God's hands, trusting that he is more capable of caring for them than I am myself. And if I will trust him with my family, he will do what is best for them. So I headed up to Siem Reap and God helped Caleb get well. A couple of months later, my family joined me when uh, we had somewhere decent, for, almost decent for them to live. And it was then that uh, God started using my family as a way of doing outreach. And our best evangelistic tools were our two little boys. They were white-skinned, white-haired, completely foreign to anything the Cambodian kids had seen before. And God, in his wisdom, not only did he place me next to a pagoda for our living, but also on the street of one of the two high schools in the town. So every day, hundreds of kids would come by where we were living. And they were fascinated by these two boys and would come to stop and look. 
And it wasn't very long before they started asking Wendy to teach English language to them. And so open, God opened the door through the boys to start a ministry through English for bringing people to Jesus. Well, we were able to get a small church started there in Simreep Town. And that was exciting. And God had said that I, he wanted me to be a pastor. I said, not possible, but it became possible by default because there wasn't anyone else to lead this church and that we were starting. And so, in effect, yes, I had become a church pastor. But as my ADRA project was coming to an end, as Jennifer had said earlier on, God began speaking to me in my devotional times. Now, we were still fully committed. God, we will do anything, go anywhere for any length of time. You just show us what you want us to do. And God was saying to me, I want you to go and live out in the rice fields with poor Cambodian people. I want you to live like them. I want you to start a church amongst them. I want you to buy land out there, and I want you to develop a training center to train Cambodian people to share the gospel. And God said, I want you to take all of your savings and invest it in this project and to just trust me. He also said, and I don't want you to ask anybody for money. That's his job. So... I went to Wendy and I told her what God was laying on my heart and she began to think that I'd gone crazy because uh, we've got two small boys. What I hadn't told you about Seam Rib was that um, it was still a war zone. In fact, you know, we came here in 92 and 93 was our first time to visit Penang, Malaysia and to meet Dr. Yuji. And that was after the Khmer Rouge had attacked our town here in Siem Reap, and we had been evacuated. So uh, it was a pretty wild west country back then. And everybody had a gun, not just a little handgun. They had an AK-47 or an M-16 rifle. And now God's asking us to move out into the countryside and, and live in a little thatched house uh, out in the rice fields. It seemed pretty crazy. <laughs> and Wendy thought so. But she was committed to that promise we'd made to God. Go anywhere, do anything for any length of time. And she was willing to pray about it. And God showed her that was his plan for our family. Now, fortunately for us, we had uh, read books about George Mueller and so we knew something about what it means to live by faith, at least from somebody else's story. And so we made this decision. We're going to trust God, just like George Mueller trusted God. And we're going to go out there and just let God lead us. The idea of training Cambodian people, Adventists, to become church planters, church leaders, you know, that was crazy. Like I said, I never studied theology. Yeah, I'd been leading a little house church. Well, it's different to train people to start churches. Uh, but again, God has promised us that whatever we ask in the name of Jesus for his glory, it will be given unto us. And so armed with many promises in the Bible, and one of the main ones was Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. We claim these promises, and we told Adra we will not be renewing our contract. And so on December 31, 1995, I received my last paycheck. And I haven't missed a paycheck as in I haven't received one, but I haven't missed it either because God has always been faithful. God showed us where he wanted to buy land. Uh, he 
in his wisdom, uh, foresaw a location that people would be happy to sell because it was soil that was not good for rice growing. In fact, it was not good for anything. And so it would be easy to purchase. It was uh, six kilometers out of town along a dusty, bumpy road. It was somewhat isolated because there was no road into this land at the time. And so we were able to purchase 19 hectares of land for just under $10,000. And people, they told us that we'd wasted our money. They looked at this land and it was literally trash land. Uh, it had termite hills all over it, some of them three meters high. It had very, very few trees on it. Uh, it was sandy. But again, God can see what can become of something if love and care and his power is poured into it. And we need, to, it's been a good lesson for me with, with regard to people. As I look at this land today, it's got towering trees all over it. It's green. You look at it from uh, Google Maps, and it stands out as this, this green oasis in the middle of the rice fields, uh, which are now actually housing estates. But God could see that. I couldn't see that, but I trusted him. And so we bought this land and we began developing it and we began reaching out to the community around us. We invited a Cambodian family to join us and help us in what we were doing. And uh, life, life was fun, but it was tough. I mean, we were living in a little thatched house that cost 300, I think it was $320 to build. And it was four meters by five meters in size. And we had our family of four in this little house. Um, the roof was grass. The floor was wooden boards. They bounced up and down. Bamboo windows, bamboo and grass door. Um, but, but God was good. And Wendy, my wife, she was amazing. The kitchen was a little clay cooking stove next to the steps to the front of the house. Um, but she did not complain. And so we began our work and God began to bless and lead. We began building houses for housing lay people when they came. We built ourselves a, uh, a new house, uh, which we moved into just after a year um, of living here in our thatched house. And we saw our $20,000 disappear, but we never ran out. God kept his promise and just kept on supplying. As we came to um, starting this lay training program, well, that's a, that was going to be a whole new leap in faith because up until then it had been just our two families, our family and this Khmer family that we were supporting to work with us. But now we're going to invite a whole bunch of people to come here and live for four months and uh, we're going to provide for all their needs while they're here for four months. And money had run out. Well, it seemed that it had run out. There was enough for food. But we stepped out in faith. And as we were putting everything into place, God had a man come to visit us. Some of you may know his name, Denzel McNeilis. He was brought to us by Elder Mike Ryan. And Elder Mike Ryan heard about what we were doing, about our crazy faith journey, and decided to bring Denzel McNeilis along to see what Denzel could do to help. We didn't know anything about this until they came. And I rode my bicycle into town to meet Denzel McNeilis. Um, that was my transport, a bicycle. And Denzel, with his desire to help spread the gospel, donated $72,000 toward getting our church planting training going and getting churches planted. And that was an, an amazing 
sign from God. It's like God was saying, I've got you covered. Don't worry. Just move in faith. And so we began this faith journey. We began the training program, the first one, and we had 22 people join us. And we were developing the curriculum and teaching them. And exciting things were happening. Um, we got involved with deliverance ministry, casting out evil spirits in the name of Jesus. And uh, God was using that to do miracles. Wendy had a health ministry going, and that was breaking down barriers in our community. And so it was in 1998 when we had our first baptism in this uh, in our community here at what we call Wat Pri Yisu today. And God uh, continued to bless. And at the end of that training, four-month training, we sent nine teams out to start churches. And we let them choose where they wanted to go. And uh, all of a sudden, I've, not, I've now moved from being the town, the town church pastor to being a church pastor here at uh, Wat Pri Yisru and a trainer of church planters. And now we have 10 church plants, basically a district supervisor. <laughs> For churches. And we were working closely with the Cambodia Adventist Mission on this project. Um, and it wasn't long before they had a need for a district pastor and in the same area that I was already roughly covering. And they needed to start churches in some new areas. And they said to me, um, soon as you're already out and about, why don't you take on these areas as well? And so here I am, untrained as a pastor, and now having the largest uh, geographical district in Cambodia as my pastorate, and also uh, having the most number of congregations of any other pastor uh, or any of the pastors to take care of, as well as doing um, this lay training program. And all of this was honorary, no salary. And it was an amazing experience to see God working, uh, using our family's lives to influence other people's lives for the kingdom of heaven. Well, it was uh, after that first training program that we decided to start a school. And we took one of our local converts who had gone through the training, four months training program, and she had grade, grade two or grade three education. She wasn't very highly educated as far as formal schooling, but uh, she could read and write Khmer, and uh, she learned some English. And so we gave her the job as our first school teacher. And she had a little veranda. That was her schoolroom and a board and about 20 kids from the poorest of the poor. Well, I don't think I imagined back then what God would do. So today our school is K-12. Uh, prior to COVID, we would have a, over 300 students. Um, we have since started a, another school, so we have two schools now. Um, and, and God has really expanded the work and use the school to reach people in our community to because we have a boarding area we also are able to bring kids from adventist churches in other parts of the country in and give them an education and that's been really exciting and for me one of the amazing things is today i look at my staff my teaching staff and with the exception of my two sons and my wife and myself, and we just we have a new volunteer principal. Uh, if we take all the foreigners out of the picture, then and we take out the teacher who was our first teacher. She still teaches in our school. Um, then that leaves twenty five teachers 
all of who are former students in our school, many of them who came to our school as Buddhists, but have experienced the love of Christ in their hearts and given their lives to Jesus. So it's a wonderful thing just to sit there in staff room with all the staff around and just look around these, the staff and realize that today they are there because our family were willing to put everything in the line, on the line for God and just trust him. And they themselves are now sharing the gospel with others, helping to make the love of God a reality in the lives of other children. Well, I was asked earlier by Jennifer, how many kids do we care for? How many people do we care for? Uh, currently, there's around about 260 people on campus. And all of them are financially dependent on God including my family and my son's families. Um, and we still do not solicit funds. God told us not to do that. And we have chosen to be obedient in that area and try to be obedient in every area. And God provides. Now, how does that work? Well, let me give you an example. Um, this month, we reopened our school after being closed for quite a few months because of COVID. We chose to reopen illegally. We're not supposed to have reopened. But in order to do so, we chose to have all kids going to our school living on the campus, which meant basically everybody that wasn't already here became a dorm student. But COVID has created great poverty out there in the community. And it was quite obvious that even if people could pay the very small school fee of $17 a month, there was no way they were going to be able to pay the dormitory fee. And we spend a dollar a day per person on food. It's not very much, but that's more than they would pay or spend it back at home. So we made a faith decision. We made the decision that these are God's kids. He's going to pay the bill. And so we invited them, come. And uh, God will provide the food. And uh, if you can, pay the fees. And so we currently have 130 kids in the school. And um, God has been providing. Uh, tomorrow is the last day of the month. And we are looking forward to seeing what God has, is sending for next month because the funds this month have been expended. And that's one of the really fun things I've learned being a faith-based missionary is that when God sends us money, he doesn't send it to us to hoard. He sends it to us to spend on his kingdom. And so that's what we do. When money comes in, we spend it on whatever we believe it will bring God glory. And then we wait for him to provide for the next thing. And uh, so usually uh, we have what we call manna months. Manna months are where we look to God for provision on a daily basis. And we've done this now since 1996, and God has never failed us. Sometimes we have Canaan months. Canaan months is when we have enough money in the bank at the beginning of the month to last us a whole month, and sometimes beyond. And during COVID, God has been very generous, and we have been going through um, Canaan months. But now, as we were getting ready to reopen the school, those funds weren't sitting there in the bank like they had been at the beginning of the month. So we were back to trusting God, just like the Israelites in the desert, that every month, every day, sorry, <laughs> there would be food for that day. And we have seen God honoring that faith. Now, I didn't tell you about our orphanage, so I should do that because that's been an amazing part of the work that God gave us as well. And I have only a very limited time left, so I, I've got to share this fast. But in 19, sorry, yeah, in 1998, uh, when Wendy was running the uh, clinic, we were having people coming in and dying of full, full blown AIDS. And they came to be cared for because nobody wanted to care for them. 
And we realized then that there were children that were being orphaned because of AIDS and their extended family didn't want them for fear of AIDS themselves. So we began to see that God wanted us to have an orphanage here. And it, it was in 2003 when we opened the orphanage. And it, it, it started to fill really quickly, somewhat like George Mueller's experience. And it wasn't very long before we had gone from just a handful of kids to 196 children. And the children were being cared for in large families, a husband and wife taking care of up to 16 kids plus their own. But God was providing, not only providing for food, but providing for the education costs and also providing for expanding our infrastructure so we could handle more children. And so the orphanage grew very quickly. And that was an amazing experience to be able to bring kids who had been abandoned sometimes, who had been abused, who had been orphaned because of AIDS or other things, and, and to provide them with a place where they could experience the love of Jesus for the first time. And I was always amazed how fast those kids would respond to the love of Jesus. Like within two weeks, these kids that are coming out of Buddhist homes, they're just happy to be sitting in church and, and listening to people singing and trying to learn to sing um, and, and to be able to experience what it's like to be a part of a big, loving family. So God used the orphanage in a powerful way to bring many children to Jesus. And uh, many of those Children have grown up and come on to staff and work for us now. And uh, many others have gone out um, after finishing their education and are being successful. Uh, we have some in different countries now who have married uh, volunteers that have come here and they have uh, taken up uh, residence in other countries. But God is, is, has certainly been working uh, through the orphanage. So we've got the orphanage and the school and our two schools. But it was uh, in 19, uh, sorry, 2014 that God, he gave me the most crazy idea. Now, I, I guess the idea of moving out into the countryside was really crazy. Uh, but in 2014, when we are living by faith, living manor months, God said, I want you to build a butterfly garden for tourists. It's a way to reach out with the gospel, reach out about creation to the tourists. And it's like, God, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, I'm a biologist, um, but it's crazy. Yes, I, I have been uh, to a lot of butterfly gardens, uh, like the one there in um, Penang, but it's crazy. I'm busy. Uh, I'm running a school and an orphanage. Um, and, and besides that, God, Jesus is coming soon. And there's not enough time to do this project. Well, I tried arguing with God, but I learned that you can't win an argument with God. God will always win. Unless you're too stubborn to, to realize that he won. And so we began planning uh, this project, and I don't usually do budgets because when you live by faith, you don't need a budget. You just need faith. But for this one, because I wanted to talk God out of it, I sat down and figured out a budget and said, God, this is going to cost $400,000. And we are living from day to day. And you've told me I can't ask for money. And uh, God convinced me that $400,000 was nothing. For him, just to trust him. And so we began building, and today Butterfly Paradise has been open for nearly three years. Even uh, during this COVID time, when tourism has completely vanished from uh, Sim Rim, uh, we've kept it open, even though we have no tourists. God has provided us enough to keep the staff paid and keep the place running, keep the animals fed, keep the butterflies breeding. Uh, so God has taught me uh, through that experience, nothing is too big for him. 
His greatest challenge is us. Because we're either too stubborn, we're too faithless, or we just want to run away. But as I've surrendered to God, I've seen him work amazing miracles. And there's no way right now that I would want to say no to God, no matter how crazy the idea is. Because when we say yes and we proceed in faith for his glory, we will see God work miracles that we could never imagine. And we will get to do things that we could never have imagined we would do. So in my busyness of running a school and running an orphanage, I've been able to build uh, Butterfly Paradise, which is one of the largest butterfly gardens in the world, enclosed butterfly gardens, and to keep it running. Uh, we've also added into that a tropical plant garden center where people can come in and buy plants. We have, I think, over uh, around 15,000 plants in the tropical plant garden center. Um, and God, God has been able to do all that simply because I made myself available and I trusted him. And so as I wind up right now, I want to encourage each of you to make yourself available to God. It's very tempting to make yourself available maybe for one day a week, maybe for a couple of months. But God is asking us to make ourselves available for eternity. He wants us now and he wants us for eternity. And he wants us to just surrender. So one of my, uh, one of my favorite verses is in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, where uh, Paul says, it's no longer I that lives, but it's Christ that lives in me. And that has become my daily prayer. Christ, I want you to live in me. I want you to live out your life through me so that your love can touch the lives of others and transform their lives and so that they can experience the joy that only you can give. And so as I've shared my missionary experience uh, from 1985 until now, I want you to encourage you to go on your knees and say, God, I'll go anywhere, I'll do anything for any length of time. Whatever you ask, just give me the faith to trust you. And God may say, what you're doing now is what I want you to be doing until I come. Or he may say, thank you. Let me take you on a journey that you will never regret and that will fill your life with joy as you see what I can do through you to change the world and to make, to help others experience the love of God and the plan of salvation. So as I pray now to close, I pray that you will join me in that prayer, that you will make that surrender and that you will say, God, it's no longer I that lives. It's Christ that lives in me. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, you're an awesome God, and you have chosen us, fallen, weak, frail, impatient children of yours, to carry on the work that Jesus began when he was on this earth. We certainly don't deserve that honor or that responsibility. But we pray that you will help each one of us to be faithful. That you will help us to realize that if we really want to experience joy and happiness in this life, there is only one place to find that, and that is in your will. Being where you want us, doing what you want us to do for as long as you want us to do it. And so I pray for each of our listeners 
tonight that your Holy Spirit will work in their hearts and that if they have never done this before, that they will do it now and say, God, I'm all yours. I want you to take my life and use it in the way that will bring you the most glory and the most honor. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of sharing. Thank you for what you've done in my life, in the life of my family and the people we've been able to impact. And we pray, Father, that you will use each one of us to hasten the coming of Jesus so we can all meet in the kingdom of heaven. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.